This is the fourth in a series of videos that I'm making to support a number theory course that I'm teaching in the fall of 2020. We just got done talking about divisibility and the division algorithm. Now we're ready to talk about the greatest common divisor. So let's maybe look at the definition. So we want to suppose that A and B are integers, and we say that D, which is a natural number, is a common divisor of A and B if D divides A and D divides B. So that's a pretty logical definition there. Furthermore, we say that D is the greatest common divisor of A and B, and we'll write D equals GCD AB if when C divides A and C divides B, we know that C divides D. So in other words, if we've got another common divisor, C, C must divide that greatest common divisor. So our ordering here is like by divisibility. Okay, so two quick examples before we start proving things. First off, the GCD of 12 and 20 is four. And so you can see that just by kind of elementary school arithmetic. One and two are also common divisors, but one divides four and two divides four. Next, the GCD of 18 and 30 is six. So again, by elementary school arithmetic, we know that. One, two, and three are also common divisors, but one divides six, two divides six, and three divides six. So you can play this game all day long with small numbers, but eventually we'll need some sort of method for finding the greatest common divisor of larger numbers. That's actually something we're working towards. Okay, so let's get rid of this and we'll look at our first result. Okay, so the first theorem that we want to look at is about writing the GCD of two integers as a linear combination of those two integers. So let's start by supposing we have non-zero integers A and B. You could extend this to having one of them be zero, but it's not super interesting. Then there are integers x and y such that the GCD of a and b is equal to ax plus by. Okay, so let's maybe see how this proof goes. And this proof uses a similar technique to what we saw with the division algorithm. So we're gonna consider some sort of set and then use properties of the natural numbers in order to get something out of that set. So here's what we'll do. We'll take this set, which I'll call A, to be AU plus BV, as U and V range over all integers, and then I'll intersect that with the natural numbers. And I should say here I'm taking the natural numbers not to include zero. So if you want to put like a star up here to say that we're just including the positive integers, then you can do that if you're psyched. Okay, so now my first little claim here is that my set A is not equal to the empty set. Now, how could we do that? Well, since A and B are both non-zero, notice that the absolute value of A is equal to plus or minus A, that's an element from A. Well, if A is negative, we'll just take negative A, that makes it positive. That makes it a natural number, so it's in both of these sets. Just take U to be negative one. And then similarly, the absolute value of B is in the set A. Now, if we only took one of those to be non-zero, then obviously you would take whichever one here is non-zero. Okay, so now that we've got a non-empty set of natural numbers, we know it's a set of natural numbers because of this intersection, it has a least element by the Archimedean principle. So let's let D equal that least element. So I'll set D equal to the minimum of A. So let's just put here that we're doing this by the Archimedean principle, which says, or it's equivalent to every set of natural numbers having a smallest element. But now that D is of the form AU plus BV. So what we'll do is we'll take 
x and y integers to be the values of u and v that make this happen. So I'm just going to write this as such that d equals ax plus by. Okay, but now look what we've got going on here. It looks like we're constructing exactly what we want. So that'll be our next claim is that we've actually constructed what we want. In other words, D is equal to the GCD of A and B. But we don't have room for that here. So let's start over at the top. Okay, so on the last board, we constructed this number D as a linear combination of A and B as the minimum of some set A, which we had on the last board. Now I want to claim that D is the GCD of A and B. So we'll start by proving that it is a common divisor of A and B. In other words, D divides A and D divides B. Okay, so let's maybe see how we can do that. Well, let's first start by dividing A by D with remainder using the division algorithm. So let's notice that there exists unique Q and R such that A equals D times Q plus R, where zero is less than or equal to R, which is strictly less than D. So again, that's just applying the division algorithm to D and A. Well, what can we do from there? Well, I can solve this for R. So let's notice that R is equal to A minus DQ. But recall that D was equal to AX plus BY. So here we have A minus AX plus BY times Q. Okay, but now we can put this in terms of A and B. In other words, like rearrange this. Notice we have one minus X times Q times A minus B times Q times Y. Well, look, that's a linear combination of A and B, which means it's either in the set A or it's equal to zero. Now, how do we know that? Well, look, R is between zero and D. So that means it's either a natural number already or it's equal to zero. Notice, if it's a natural number, that means that it's in A. But if it's in A, it's less than the smallest element from A. So that's impossible. So it being in A is not a possibility, which means it's equal to zero. But if the remainder is equal to zero, that means we've proven that D divides A. And then very, very similarly, really just switching A with B, we'll see that D also divides B. So that means check, we've got that it's a common divisor. Now we just need to show that it is the greatest common divisor. Okay, like I said, we just got done proving that D was a common divisor of A and B. Now we want to show that it's the greatest common divisor. So let's suppose that we have another common divisor. C which divides A and it divides B. But notice that means that C divides AX plus BY by something we proved in a previous video. But if C divides AX plus BY, that's exactly the same thing as saying that C divides D. So we started with a common divisor and we showed that it divided our would-be greatest common divisor. So that finishes this proof that D is the GCD of A and B, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this and we'll move on to some other ideas. So our next little result is a proposition involving objects of the form AX plus BY and how they're related to the GCD. So let's suppose that A, B, X, and Y are all integers then this object AX plus BY is always a multiple of the GCD of A and B, which I'll call D. So we know that we can write the GCD in this form. Well, it turns out the only numbers that we can write in this form are multiples of that GCD. Okay, so let's maybe see how this proof goes. 
Well, notice if D is the GCD of A and B, then that means that D divides A and D divides B. But if D divides A and D divides B, that means that D divides AX plus BY. That's going to be true for all X and Y. But saying that D divides that AX plus BY is the same thing as saying that AX plus BY is a multiple of D. Those are two different ways of saying the same thing. Okay, so now let's look at a corollary of this proposition. So here's a super important corollary of this proposition, which actually allows you to find out when things have a GCD of one, when it might be tricky to do otherwise. So let's say we've got integers a and b, and there exist other integers x and y such that ax plus by is equal to one. Then the GCD of a and b is equal to one. So that's actually gonna follow from this very, very quickly, and it's pretty easy to show. So let's say that D is equal to the GCD of A and B, but that means that D divides AX plus BY by this proposition, but AX plus BY is one, so that means D divides one, but there are only two integers that divide one, plus and minus one. But GCDs are always positive, so that means plus one is the only possibility for D. So here we've got D is equal to one. In other words, the GCD of A and B are one. So if it is possible to take a linear combination of two integers and get one, that means they are immediately relatively prime. Okay, so let's finish this video off with one proposition and one extension of this notion of greatest common divisor. So one more proposition. So if the GCD of A and B is one and the GCD of A and C is one, then the GCD of A and B times C is also one. So how can we do this? Well, we'll use the theorem that we had before as well as the proposition and corollary that we just went over. So let's maybe go ahead and take X, Y, Z, and W, which are all integers, such that AX plus BY is equal to the GCD of A and B, which is one. So that's possible by that theorem. And then AZ plus CW is equal to one. That's because the GCD of A and C is one, again, by that theorem. Now, we'll just multiply both sides of this equation. So that tells us that AX plus BY times AZ plus CW is equal to one times one, which is equal to one. But now let's multiply that out. So here we'll get A squared XZ plus AC XW plus AB times YZ plus BC times YW equals one. But now let's look at what our goal is. Our goal is to show that the GCD of A with BC is equal to one. But we can do that if we can write a linear combination of A and BC is equal to one. We'll notice here we've got BC, and then in all of the rest of these terms, we have A. So let's maybe factor out accordingly. So here we have A times AXZ plus CXW plus BYZ plus BC times YW is equal to one. So we've written one as a linear combination of A with BC, but that condition implies that the GCD of A with BC is equal to one by the corollary that we just discussed. Okay, so this is our last proposition. Now let's look at an extension of the greatest common divisor to more than two entries. Okay, so we can iteratively define the GCD of more than two numbers. So we can do it like this. The GCD of A1, A2 up to AN is equal to the GCD of A1 with the GCD of A2 up to AN. So notice here, we're really just taking the GCD of two numbers, A1 and that other GCD. So you can layer these GCDs on top of each other.
So let's look at two quick examples. So the GCD of 15, 10, and 30 is five, and that's because the GCD of 10 and 30 is 10, and then the GCD of 15 and 10 is clearly five. And then through a similar argument, the GCD of 100, 34, and 64 is equal to four. Okay, great. Well, let's finish this video off with some warm-up problems to do before class, if you're in my class, and maybe just for fun if you're not. So we'll finish this video with a couple of warm-up problems that are to turn in at the beginning of the next class if you're in my course. So the first one is really an extension of that first theorem we proved. So let's show that if D is equal to the GCD of A, B, and C, then there are integers X, Y, and Z such that AX plus BY plus CZ equals D. So you can either mimic what the proof of that theorem looked like, or you can apply that theorem if you're careful. Okay. Next, let's find the GCD of these two pairs of numbers. So negative 12, 18, and 1,001, 289. And then finally, show that for all natural numbers k, 3k plus 2 and 5k plus 3 are relatively prime. In other words, their GCD is equal to 1. Okay, that's a good place to stop.